Our first uh, speaker is Professor Robert Yu. He is an emeritus professor in land management at the Anglia Ruskin University in Oxford and has research on planning and serving history of the Middle East in the, in the 20th century. His best known publication is, and I quote, of planting and planning, the making of British colonial cities, and he has undertaken field work in Israel and Lebanon relevant to his paper. Professor no, please. I'll just be, uh, give you the permission to, uh, to share with us. Just a second. Now you can share your presentation. Okay. Here it comes. Okay. So shall I start? Sure, sure. The floor is, the floor is yours. Um, thanks to Western Galilee College for inviting me to participate. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, and unfortunately I missed yesterday's presentations, where I understand that uh, questions of land did come up from time to time. It's all, it's going, all going to, to be on YouTube, YouTube so, so you'll see, you'll see it, it eventually. eventually. Okay, that would be good. Um, my own interest in land in Israel and Palestine goes back more than 20 years, and really started with the Oslo Agreement and Land for Peace, which of course failed as an initiative. And because I'm a historian of British colonialism, I thought, well, let's look into this. Uh, and so my title is Land Policy in the British Mandate Period in Palestine, 1918 to 48. And of course, the British, that mandate only lasted 30 years. But a lot of it was concerned with land. And if you go back in time to 1901, the Jewish National Fund started to buy land in Palestine in trust for the Jewish people. The British occupiers of Palestine started as early as 1920 to keep statistics to identify Jewish buyers of land. Uh, in advance of the League of Nations mandate, Article 6 of which refers to encouraging close settlement of Jews on the land, including state lands and waste lands not required for public purposes, while ensuring that the rights and positions of other sections of the community are not credited. Well, that turned out to be very hard to do. And in the following 15 years, uh, some 40 ordinances were passed in Palestine, some of them amended several times, uh, to do with land. And of course, as the occupying power, the British mandate was required to maintain the system of land tenure inherited from the Ottomans. And as they described it, enriched by amendments, by Palestine orders in council. This is according to the survey of Palestine just after the Second World War. And in 1935, there was a, a very substantial book published by Godby and Dukan uh, on land law in Palestine, which has been described by the scholar John Strawson as a masterpiece of how colonial regimes occupy legal systems. And so to go back to before 1918, under Ottoman land tenure, there were basically five types. There was milk land, which was fully owned, usually urban freehold. There was miri land, which was the largest proportion of um, land use, cultivated land with heritable use rights. And if left uncultivated for more than three years, it would revert to the state. The third category is state land used for public purposes, and usually referred to as matruhi land, withdrawn for special public purposes. 
Then there's Malat land, dead land, uncultivated, vacant, desert or mountain, uh, which of course includes the Negev. And there it is possible to redeem it from its desolation by starting to cultivate. And then the fifth category is Wakf land, which is trust, held in trust for religious and charitable purposes. And this, if you go back to the Middle Ages, was quite an important influence on the creation of trusts in English common law. And the Ottomans, in the middle of the 19th century, entered the Tanzimat period, which means apparently setting in order, passed a land code in 1838. And key to this is the Tapu. And the tapu is a kind of land register, but the word means act of homage, so that users of miri land, basically farmland, could record their rights in land books that were kept locally to the community. Then, at the same time, British colonialism became very interested in land surveying and recording of land rights. And indeed, they set up an empire survey review uh, in the 1920s. And some of this is concerned with the land policy in Palestine. And it was the British in 1841 who carried out the first geodetic survey of the Holy Land. It was their own archaeological explorations and it was based, as you can see from the plan here, on uh, trigonometry. Trig trigonometry. Sorry, I'm stumbling over the word there. But they would go to the highest points and then measure from there. And the British also developed the New Zealand system of standard survey, where you surveyed district by district until you completed the whole territory. And New Zealand was where this was, it was tested in all sorts of uh, colonies, Ireland and India, and it was most recognized in New Zealand as scientific survey. The scientific survey approach was to survey the colonial lands with trigonometric methods. And perhaps not many people realize that Mount Everest is named after a, a British land surveyor working in India in the 1850s. And it was also in the 1850s that the Torrens system was tried out in South Australia. And this meant that the state would guarantee title to land because it would record on the register who had rights to land. This was to um, prevent fraudulent multiple sales of land, and it turned out to be quite successful. The state would guarantee any defects in the register, and they would pay out money. But in South Australia, it was so successful that very little money was ever, ever had to be paid out. And in the Middle East, starting really with Egypt and then moving into Palestine and also Transjordan and what is now Iraq, then Mesopotamia, um, the British applied land settlement. And this has a particular meaning. It's about going around, identifying who owns, who claims land, and then giving individual land rights adjudicated by the government through cadastral surveys. And the famous name in this context is Dowson, Sir Ernest Dowson, who is kind of the, let's call him the world leader in cadastral surveying in the 20s onwards. He had been the director general of the survey of Egypt from 1909 to 1923. And then he, he was lucky enough to retire early from Egypt and became a consultant. And he worked in Palestine and Iraq 
and Tanganyika and Zanzibar and Kenya, and after his death, his co-worker, Shepard, produced a sort of standard textbook on land registration. In Egypt, here's an example of what the cadaster might have looked like, well, it's an actual case. And through the middle, the diagonal is, I think, a canal. And then the uh, various boundaries are demarcated of the farmland around. So the Dawson approach in the 1920s, the beginning of the mandate period, was to, first of all, establish a digest of what the existing land law is, then to undertake a scientific survey, which started in Palestine in 1921 for this purpose, and had they cr had created a geodetic network, a more detailed one, by 1930. And they claimed that Palestine was the only country in the world which has succeeded in completing its entire framework in advance of the detailed survey. And then the pre-existing Ottoman Taku register was converted into a general register of adjudicated land rights. And even before the mandate, was declared, the 1920 Land Transfer Ordinance laid down this new framework for land and land buying and selling. And the British sent a team to Istanbul, where the Ottoman Tapu registers were kept, and photographed a quarter of a million entries in 1927. And the final stage would be to have a systematic valuation of land for tax purposes, as was being done in the UK at the same time. And then after 1948, uh, with the creation of Israel, the new nation um, established a covenant with the Jewish National Fund, the KKL, and created the Israeli Land Authority. And that is, I understand, responsible or, or is the final authority for 93% of the land of Israel. The other 7% being mostly uh, milk freehold land. And in 1969, after the um, Six Day War, the old Ottoman land classifications were brought to an end. And I now just want to look at some key words which help us to understand what was going on. The first key word is settlement. Well, the League of Nations mandate referred to close settlement on the land. A settlement can mean all sorts of things. It can mean a human settlement, a village, a town, a city. Uh, in English poor law, uh, somebody who wanted to claim benefits had to prove in the 19th century that they had a settled status in the jurisdiction. So if they were born in a certain parish, then they could claim under the poor laws, um, some help from the parish. But in Palestine and elsewhere in the British Empire, settlement had a particular meaning, as I've just mentioned. There was a paid government officer who traveled around settling land claims and coming up with the uh, definitive register of land rights and often when the officer arrived in an Arab village for example there would be multiple claims on land and there would be families claiming different family members who had claims and the settlement officer would then decide the preference being to have a single person name as the owner with rights to use that land. So that was the system, although by the 1930s, 
with the Arab revolt after 1929, it was increasingly difficult for settlement officers to do their job. And I don't know what percentage of the land area of Israel, um, or Palestine that is, had been through the settlement process when after the Second World War, everything collapsed, and in 1948, the State of Israel was born. So that's the particular meaning of settlement. Then there's this word transfer. Um, and the newly created land register um, regulated transfers of land. And many purchases of land I put it the wrong way around here, it was from Arabs to Jews in the 1920s and 30s. And that was how the uh, Jewish community built up its, its land um, control over land. And the third key word is partition. And this became internationally significant after the First World War, and especially with the idea of transfers of population, particularly the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne. And this was applied for the transfer of Turks and Greeks, where the Greeks who had been, uh, many of them living in the Black Sea area in what is now Turkey, were required to go back to Greece, and the much smaller numbers of Turks who had been in Greece during the Ottoman period had to go back to Turkey. And there was a lot of maneuvering and manipulation of land rights. For example, islands close to the mainland of Turkey might discover overnight that a, a road had been built to transfer land to the mainland, so it's no longer an island. And in Israel, after 1948, an Ottoman equivalent mechanism was used of land readjustment, where multiple land ownerships could be combined, and one person or one family could bring together their different land holdings into one place. This at one time was, was very popular, and it is now being applied in many countries in the world. Uh, and it's an established land tool for improving the efficiency of land. So partition, of course, in Palestine meant the, the, the Peel Commission and the idea of separating the Jews and the Arabs with land readjustment accompanying them. And then the third category, sorry, the fourth category is absentee ownership. And after the First World War, during the First World War, um, the British had a custodian of enemy property office. And this was applied in the Middle East, particularly in Palestine, but elsewhere as well, uh, in, in Africa, for instance, when the British took over German colonies or Turkish Ottoman land, they would say, well, the custodian will keep a record of the enemy property that has been abandoned. And this was a, a classic mechanism for gradually um, transferring that property to a different person. And it was applied to the Arabs in Palestine, Palestinians who were displaced after the 1948 war, um, who were classed either as enemies because they had left the boundaries of Israel and were staying in the adjoining countries. So they were considered to be enemies because they crossed over to the other side, as it were. And some of them were in this unusual category of a present absentee, who might, these might be Arabs still in Israel, 
but separated from their land. And so they could also lose it. And over time, in the 1950s, the Ottoman provision for Miri land to be lost if it hadn't been cultivated for a number of years um, was applied in many areas. There was a mechanism for transferring former Arab land to the Israeli land authority. And that's my presentation. I published it in two journals in, in the last 20 years or so. And here is my email address. And if you want to contact me, I can send you what I've, what I've had and what I've had done over the last 20 years. So that concludes my presentation. And I'd be very interested to hear any questions or comments. Thank you.